Welcome to Social Work in Healthcare. This class is designed to actually look at some very complex information in a very short time. So I'm going to begin with just a brief history of social work in healthcare uh, to provide that information. And then next, I'm going to provide an overview of the different payment structures of healthcare system in the United States. And then we'll look at some roles and responsibilities in contemporary times of social work. So those will be three different presentations for this first module. So let's begin by looking at a history of social work in healthcare. And actually, social work has a long history of being in the healthcare realm. And not, this is, this is looking at healthcare from a physical health standpoint. We certainly can't divorce the mental health aspect of it when we're looking at the physical health, but this is working with individuals related to their physical health. And then social work is the one profession that actually brings together the importance of the mental health and the physical health. So we started in healthcare, like I said, many years ago, and it evolved from uh, the services through the charitable organizations um, to public health and hospital settings. If you remember your Social Work 101 from your undergraduate program or from your foundation program, you'll know that Social Work evolved from the charitable organizations and then there was a connection into the healthcare and the hospital settings at that time. And we are actually view, viewed as one of the oldest and most well-established fields of uh, professional social work from the healthcare perspective. So we began working with social factors that influence health, mental health, illness, and disease when our profession evolved in Western society. So we do have that long history. Um, unfortunately, many of our roles and our responsibilities have been... Um, I guess minimized as healthcare has progressed, but we are one of the older professions that go back to the 1900s in terms of working with health, illness, and then the social factors that impact those. <clears throat> and if you remember your history of social welfare policy, you'll know that early in the uh, development of the United States, um, you know, healthcare was considered a private matter and individuals and their families were expected to take care of themselves. And if somebody became ill at home, you know, it was the family who provided the care. So it was very much a family affair, the health of individuals. We still have some of that today. There's um, culturally, there's some different expectations in terms of different cultural patterns in the United States, urban, rural, um, different racial, ethnic heritage in terms of how you care for your loved ones if they become ill, um, especially ill if it's a chronic illness or if it's a debil de debilitating illness. But early on, it was within the families and it was a very private matter. You didn't really go to doctors and or hospitals or anything like that. Until there was, in about the 1700s, the almshouses, and they were the option of last resort. That was when there was no family or individuals to support those who became ill, or whether it be physically ill or mentally ill, or aged to the point where they couldn't take care of themselves. So these were actually indoor shelters um, for those who were considered destitute, they had no other options, and no other options means no family support, and that goes all the way back to the 1700s um, here in the United States. And this set the precedent so that only those who were socially marginalized, who were poor or isolated, um, would receive medical care in institutions middle and upper class families when they fell ill, their families took care of them at home. So it was prestigious, I guess you could say, if you had the resources in the family care, then you managed your loved ones at home. Only those who didn't have those resources and those means sought cares within an institution, which would be like the alms houses, um, 
the uh, the charity houses. There were not not hospitals per se, but those were the places where individuals would go when they didn't have the resources to take care of themselves or their family didn't have the resources to take care of them when they became ill. So then the there became a shift and the shift came with industrialization. And as the society became more industrialized and less uh, rural, less um, agricultural, medical practices grew and doctors and their sophistication grew, um, knowledge grew. And so because families were now working in factories and families were more, more mobile and some of those transitions were beginning to happen, it fed this growth of this medical practice um, from physicians primarily. Um, and it was more difficult for families to take care of their own because of this shift, this, the industrialization that began to happen in the United States. So that's where the shift began to change, and then it was going to, what we'll see today, evolve into much more of a formal institution of health care to provide for everybody and less taking care of individuals at home. So along with industrialization, the 1900s was the era when organized medicine began. Um, and this was also the time when doctors were no longer expected to provide free services to all hospital patients. Uh, this is when the sense of financial uh, responsibility started to emerge in terms of getting health care services and reimbursing those who were providing for it. So prior to this, doctors oftentimes in hospitals provided care, but the hospitals didn't pay them for them, and the patients certainly didn't have a way to pay for it. It was 1905, 1906, when Dr. Cabot um, hired the first social worker to provide social services in outpatient clinics, and then hired uh, Maud Cannon, Ida Maud Cannon, she's actually kind of known as the founder of healthcare social work, uh, to jointly organize the nation's first hospital-based social work program at Mass General Hospital in Boston. So this is when social work became a formal profession within the healthcare setting, this emerging institution of healthcare, 1905, 1906, and it goes back to the Mass... Um, General Hospital in Boston. That's where the hospital social work emerged. And you'll notice that Miss Cannon was actually a nurse. She wasn't a social worker for what we consider social works today. She was a visiting nurse and she recognized that her nursing skills were not sufficient to meet the psychosocial needs of those patients that she was visiting in the house. So those social factors that needed to be addressed. So she enrolled in the new established Boston School of Social Work and then became a social worker at that time. But he, he Dr. Cabot tapped into a nurse to begin the social work, the healthcare social work. And then she recognized she needed the special training that social workers had to be able to provide the compre comprehensive care to those in need and specifically those who she was visiting in the home and that were homebound. And from the beginning, um, Ms. Cannon, when she established the social work department, it was an interdisciplinary focus. And this is, uh, healthcare is one of the most um, interdisciplinary settings that as social workers we work in. And oftentimes we are a minority profession there, meaning that you will have much fewer social workers, obviously, than you do doctors or nurses. Um, or therapists, being physical, occupational, speech therapists, or other allied health professionals. But we still work in a very interdisciplinary setting when we're working in healthcare. And it doesn't matter whether it's in a hospital setting, in a home health setting, in a home hospice setting, in a long-term care setting, wherever the healthcare is being provided, we're going to be working in this interdisciplinary setting, which is key to providing holistic medicine. And 
she established this back when she started the social work program, Ms. Cannon did. Um, and it began with, volu- with the volunteers with focus um, on helping patients who had venereal disease and tuberculosis or neurological ailments. Um, tuberculosis, which was known as consumption, was very big. It was, it was the public health concern during this time, as was venereal disease. And actually, for those of you who resist research, um, it was the social workers that began at this uh, General Mass Boston Hospital that investigated the social correlates of tuberculosis with symptoms, severity, and prevention. So this is early public health that happened, and it was the social workers who were the professionals to perform this comprehensive analysis of tuberculosis in the United States. So these healthcare social workers that began back in the 1900s, the early 1900s, were the ones to investigate, do the research, to find out about ways to prevent the spread of tuberculosis and how social factors impacted symptoms, the severity of the disease. So social workers have a very early presence in healthcare from the perspective of bringing in that holistic perspective in terms of the social correlates with the actual illness, with the individual, with the community, and doing the research and providing the evidence to help change the outcomes for these these individuals. Thus, public health social workers, that's what they became. And um, public health social workers now continue Um, They can be found in hospitals, schools, government agencies, local community-based settings. Um, There's been more of a shift to this public health worker, um, but you can actually get some special training for public health as a social worker. And I'm sure in the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, having never experienced anything like this before within multiple generations back since the flu epidemic um, in the 1918s, um, there may be new roles emerging for social workers um, in terms of the pandemic. And the other aspect of the public health perspective, and this is public health that is being used, is where we're using social workers or it's being promoted to use social workers within policing to help the racial disparities and the negative outcomes and health outcomes to individuals of racial and ethnic minority, as well as those with mental illness from the criminal justice perspective, because that's been said to be a public health crisis also, because it does in fact impact overall health conditions for individuals. So this is how social work in the public health realm began to emerge, and it was closely tied back to hospital social work. So in the 1910s, is the American hospital really emerged as a scientific institution, um, recognizing uh, the importance of cleanliness, um, of, um, you know, the antiseptics, medications for pain relief. So we're now involve, evolving into the institution of healthcare that we see today with a more structured, scientific-based institution, physical institution, where individuals would go now to be cared for. So the shift now in perception is happening where it's going to become more prestigious to be cared for in a hospital setting than it is at home. We realize that it is going to have some uh, safer impacts at this point in time to be cared in a hospital setting when some of these factors can be controlled, specifically the cleanliness and the, the use of disinfectants and antiseptics um, in order to stop the spread of disease. In the homes back in the 1910s, um, the infrastructure wasn't so great in terms of personal hygiene and how we were able to stop the spread of disease or even our understanding of it. But with the 1910s, as hospitals began to emerge, then the shift 
started happening. And so social workers are going to become more prominent in a hospital setting, but we're going to continue to have that focus of all those social health correlates that impact the individual outcome. It was during the 1920s when um, the costs started becoming a focus. Um, you know, as we advanced in scientific discovery and more sophistication delivery of med medicine, then obviously cost the cost for it becomes an issue. Um, the relatively higher cost of medical care is new. It's a dramatic development. It happened rather quickly um, because now all of a sudden, Healthcare is not just something that happens at home. It's not where the doctors come by. You know, it's not limited. It's becoming much more sophisticated with a lot more tools, I guess you could say, um, and a lot more physical buildings that now have to be paid for um, and people working there because individuals would go there to stay 24 hours a day. So somebody had to be there. So the costs are now starting to ramp up. And then this becomes a, a focus, obviously, during the 1920s. And interestingly enough, in the 1930s, when Social Security Act was passed, health care or health insurance was, a, it was left out. Um, it, but it was during this time when Blue Cross emerged and it began offering private coverage for hospital care um, in some states. So at this point in time, if you were wealthy, you could purchase this insurance, this health insurance that would then cover your bill if you had to go into the hospital. So this in the 1930s begins the emerging of managed care, what we see today, um, in the form of being able to purchase um, some insurance, a policy that would help pay for illnesses when you had to go into the hospital. But there was no government program in the 1930s. It didn't get included in the Social Security Administration. So health insurance still wasn't seen as um, the responsibility of the government. But private individuals who could afford it were then able to start purchasing the insurance policies. So then during the 1940s, we see the emergence of penicillin, which we know took care of really um, controlling and eliminating a whole lot of disease processes that impacted the longevity of individuals. This is also when prepaid group health care begins. Um, it's seen as radical. But then this would be where you could purchase insurance into a health care that's a group health care. So you share the risk. So this is some actuary workings in terms of the finances and being able to cover the cost of health care. And again, offering it to individuals who could afford it. But it's also a time when um, it was important to have workers. And one of the incentives for getting workers into companies was to offer health benefits. And so companies who were trying to attract workers to come and work for them would offer some of these pre prepaid group health care plans. And then this was the emergence of the health benefits employer-based system that we see in place today. So during this time, it was an incentive. Um, it was difficult during the 1940s. There was more jobs than there was people. So it was difficult to get individuals to come in and fill these jobs that needed to be done. And this was a motivation. If you come and work for us, we're going to cover health care benefits for you. We're going to cover the cost of your illness if you get sick. So this, this started emerging in the 1940s, not that long ago. I mean, 60, 80 years ago. So not that long ago did these concepts start emerging. And then you can see over the years how they have just rapidly um, expanded to the point where now we have a healthcare financial institution that is a huge financially driven institution in the United States. You have healthcare, you have education, you have the criminal justice system. Um, these are huge social institutions in our United States that um, play intricately into the capitalism that we have. So in the 1950s, we start the shift in terms of looking at federal responsibility for the sick poor. Um, 
this is when we start thinking about who's going to cover the cost for long-term illnesses for those who can't cover the cost themselves. Who's responsible for that? Um, there are many more medications that become available. Um, lots of diseases are now treated um, with the new vaccines. There's prevention of a lot of childhood diseases, including polio and then various infections that happen. So now we're coming into a preventive mode. So we're going to start, instead of just treating those who get ill, we're learning how to prevent illnesses and to stop them from happening. So there's a preventive mode that starts, and then this responsibility starts coming. Who's responsible for making sure individuals engage in this preventive behavior? Who's responsible for making sure everybody gets their polio vaccine? And can we make everybody get that polio vaccine? So this is where some of these conversations start to happen. And then that federal responsibility, the federal level, not in the states or the local communities or the volunteer organizations, but at the federal level, who's going to care for the poor who become ill? Whose responsibility is that? And you can see the rapidly advancing technology, the rapidly advancing healthcare with its preventive measures, with its institutions, with its building of hospitals, with um, more doctors, the urbanization and the industrialization that's happened, the price of health care doubled in the 1960s. Um, and if you're not in the workforce, if you're not lucky enough to be in one of those employer-sponsored programs, then you're going to have a difficult time covering your expenses when it comes to health care. Now we've switched. We're, we're fully more, we're fully into an institutionalized health care setting as opposed to family taking care of individuals when they become ill, keeping it in the community, um, those expenses being at the family's expenses and um, providing the care, individuals needing to be there to provide the care, to a fully institutionalized. So now we have hospitals. We have places where people go and stay. Um, and so healthcare has just, the, the price of it has just exploded. And this is at the time when the major medical insurance um, endorses the higher cost of medicine and then they start, more and more of these insurance plans start to emerge. So we're now we're getting into that financial system that we're seeing today. Um, it's, it's emerging as a system in capitalism. So it's emerging as a way for individuals to make a living by providing health care services to those who are ill, by providing medications to those who are ill. So you have pharmacies now. You have um, nurses you have all of these individuals now who are earning their living by providing health care services. Um, <coughs> Medicare and Medicaid programs were signed into law in July 30th of 1965 under the Social Security Administration. So if you go back to your policy, then you can see how health care has emerged. It's really important for social workers to understand history, but also to understand the contemporary administrative structure of how health care is paid for, because that's how we know what our clients will qualify for to make sure that they can get access to the health care services they need. The 70s just saw a lot more of escalating health care costs, um, partially with that addition of the Medicare and the Medicaid. The Medicare expenditures obviously ramped up the amount of money that was spent on health care because it now exists. Um, rapid inflation was happening during this time. Uh, hospital expenses and profits um, were starting now. So hospitals were now seen as, pro again, profit as um, organizations that were creating profits. Changes in the medical care, again, the increased technology, the medications, um, conservative approaches to treatment, uh, all of this was becoming together to become this perfect storm. And so healthcare in the 70s rapidly changing and again, morphing more and more closer into what we see today in terms of 
a very expensive healthcare system that's often unattainable for those without the resources. So we're now starting to see a gap grow between those who have resources and those who don't have resources to receive not just health care if they're ill, but also to receive any of the preventive services that could possibly impact their lives positively, um, to get access to just physicians became difficult because it, they weren't located in areas where there were poor, um, less affluent neighborhoods. So we're now starting to see <clears throat> this diversion between the have and the have nots as healthcare costs are just going out of the, they're just expanding beyond what anybody ever envisioned. So <clears throat> in the 1980s, there was this shift towards privatization and corporatization of healthcare. So the idea is if we get healthcare into the private sector, like corporations and companies, Apple's companies, the private sector, Google's the private sector. So if we start creating a private sector for healthcare, then it's going to introduce competition and it's going to introduce cost saving measures and it's going to introduce incentives for cost savings. So the idea is that this corpor corporization of healthcare will help to reduce some of the costs that are escalating. Um, it was under Ronald Reagan when Medicare shift to what's called the DRG system, which is the Diagnostic Related Group System, instead of paid by treatment. Um, and insurance plans quickly followed this. So the DRG system, what that basically is, is if you go into the hospital with pneumonia and that's your primary diagnosis, you have a DRG of 9.1 days in the hospital. And so if you're in the hospital for 15 days or 30 days, the hospital's only going to get paid for 9.1 days. That's the diagnostic related group process. And so instead of just being paid by treatment and every day that somebody is there, they started trying to contain the, the cost of it by putting in this DRG system and then reducing it to, we're only going to pay you for this much for this particular diagnostic group because this is the average length of stay. So again, research is going into this, um, evidence is going into this, an individual who's 65 who goes into the hospital who has pneumonia. <clears throat> when we looked at everybody across the country, the average length of stay was 9.1 days. So that's what we're going to pay a hospital to treat this individual is 9.1 days. So what happens here? The incentive begins on discharge planning. So now it's not lucrative for hospitals to have individuals inside their facility for a long period of time because Medicare, which is the overarching governmental payment program, has set these restrictions and who follows? The insurance companies. So even when you have private insurance, even today, they still follow very much what Medicare does. Medicare is still more or less the gold standard in terms of how payments happen, and insurance companies follow suit there. Um, so now discharge planning becomes a focus because it's important to get these individuals out of the hospital, get them stable, get them out of the hospital. Otherwise, the hospital starts losing money. Doctors start losing money, and that becomes a problem. And again, healthcare costs... Um, rise at double the rate of inflation in the 1990s. Healthcare has steadily gone to the extremes. It is so expensive. Um, by the end of the decade, there were 44 million Americans with no health insurance at all. This is during the 1990s. Um, by June 1990, um, we had HIV AIDS that had a 60% mortality rate. So we have a public health crisis that's, emergency, that's emerging right here in healthcare um, during the 1990s. So it was, in essence, a pandemic at that time. I'm not sure how they defined it back then, um, but the HIV AIDS was certainly a public health crisis that we were having to deal with. There was a lot of stigma around it because of the populations that it was actually um, affecting in terms of the gay population, primarily men um, at that time. So the stigma around it. So what you saw happening here actually was a little bit more tweaking of 
the perspective of healthcare being a right versus an earned privilege and who deserves health care and who's going to pay for health care. Because oftentimes these individuals did not have health insurance to cover the cost of it. So when they received health care, who paid for it? And so now we're entering into that health care as a right versus health care as a earned privilege. And it comes around the stigmatization of certain vulnerable populations. And of course, in the 2000s, healthcare continued to rise. We were looking at direct to consumer advertising for pharmaceuticals, medical devices. You can see this now constantly on television where, pharma where pharmacies, um, uh, pharmaceutical companies now advertise their medications and encourage the consumer, the patient, to ask the doctor for certain medications for certain illnesses. So now we're kind of taking this um, medical approach to informing the consumer. And during the 2010s, 2020s, but now it really is all about the consumer being informed and making healthcare decisions. The context of being able to make those decisions, though, requires some health literacy, and not everybody has levels of health literacy needed to make informed decisions. Um, so there's still lots of bumps out there. But pharmaceutical companies are big drivers of the cost of health care. And if you delve into it, they indicate that they use a lot of the, they have to be able to generate a lot of that revenue to do research and development on new drugs. But what we do know is that really doesn't happen. Um, the money that they generate is profits. And so pharmaceuticals and medications are a, very touchy source um, for the United States. Now, many of the pharmaceutical companies, in order to kind of offset some of this and make them have a kinder footprint, is they do have the patient assistance programs for individuals who do not have drug coverage. And there's different qualifiers for the different medications, but as a healthcare social worker, that's one that you actually need to be aware of um, whether you're working in mental health or whether you're working in a homeless shelter or wherever you're working, because so many people could actually get access to some medications if they tapped into some of these pharmaceutical programs and put more pressure on the pharmaceutical companies to provide these medications for individuals who don't have the coverage to do that. Uh, one of the best websites for that is needymeds.com. N E E D Y M E D S dot com, and I'll put that up as a resource for everyone um, because that was a nurse and a doctor that started that, and so it's kind of a clearinghouse for the different pharmaceutical programs that are out there and links to those programs. But just know pharmaceutical companies are one of the big bears in the rising healthcare uh, cost industry um, and how much the medications cost individuals and the fact that it is profit driven. Uh, insurance companies are kind of the same. They're very much uh, profit driven in terms of how they make decisions. Does not mean that insurance companies really compromise an individual's health. Uh, I've worked in it for years and I can tell you, I can give you many of examples where insurance companies were saying the individual really needs to be discharged from the hospital and they were right. Um, you know, so they're there to control costs, obviously, but their bottom line also, too, is to line the pockets of their profit, their, um, those who profit share with them. Um, so that's a big driver behind it. But then the flip side of that is from a capitalistic perspective is that the ability to make money fuels these advances and fuels better health care. So we have to look at the whole argument and then determine what's going to be the best outcome for individuals in our society. In 2010, of course, we had the Patient Affordable Care Act, which is known as Obamacare. And I really discourage you from using the term Obamacare. Um, because that really just ties that to President Obama. And the reality is the Patient Affordable Care Act um, was one of the most 
significant regulatory changes in the U.S. healthcare industry since back in the 50s when Medicare Medicaid was passed. Um, and it does so much more than um, what individuals realize. You really have to read the whole act and understand all the components to it. So it does offer new opportunities for healthcare social workers to further define our roles and responsibilities. And we're going to be talking about that when we look at some of the roles and responsibilities of contemporary social workers. Um, as you know, the Affordable Care Act and some components of it have been tied up in the court system. Um, one of the big things, <clears throat> two of the big things the Patient Affordable Care Act provided was it removed the um, pre-existing condition clause. Prior to this being implemented, if you were to hire on at a, at a um, company, then that particular healthcare insurance could say you have to be covered for one year, 12 months. You have to pay 12 months of premiums before we're going to cover any cost of health care that is provided to you based on a condition that you have that's already existing. Um, that's, that was a big detriment. Um, if you had a 60-day a break in terms of your insurance coverage, so if you went for 60 days without insurance coverage, then they could penalize you for that one year and not cover anything if you had an existing condition. Um, so that's why individuals would do COBRA. So I lost my job or I left my job. I'm going to pay COBRA it means I pay my insurance premiums to keep my insurance going until my new insurance is in place so I don't get a gap in insurance. Um, the Patient Affordable Care Act did away with that and said you can no longer penalize somebody for a pre-existing condition. It has to be covered. That's been controversial. Um, it allowed students to stay on their, um, or children to stay on their uh, parents' health care coverage, I think, until age 26, which gets them through college oftentimes, or gets them settled into a trade or a, <laughs> a job that's going to have benefits. So that was helpful. So it does a lot of things. It also had required that um, insurances be equitable. So when you go onto the marketplace to purchase insurance, there's certain services that they have to be able to cover. One of the controversial ones had to do with reproductive health for women, and this has been in the court system. But the Patient Affordable Care Act, most components of it are being upheld because it was a very important change for our healthcare system. And we have to understand it, again, because now it impacts how our clients are able to access health care. So now that we're in the 2020s, some of the top trends, um, again, include the digital acceleration in health care. Um, and what we've seen, obviously, during the pandemic is telehealth. Um, virtual health, um, some changes. Uh, the government had um, eased some restrictions on being able to provide telehealth for mental health services as well as physical health services. So this is actually becoming um, more accepted and individuals are more comfortable with it. It was accelerated during the pandemic. Um, artificial intelligence and automation is important in healthcare. This is one area. This is um, really my area, primary interest um, right now in terms of research, and I've partnered with a company out of India, and we're researching uh, robots, uh, personal robots in assisted living in nursing homes. Um, we're going to be putting one in a home related to home health in order to reduce falls, increase um, socialization, um, and safety. So this is something that is trending today, that social workers are going to need to be able to to we're going to have to get into that digital world and we're going to have to be able to provide services virtually and we're going to have to be able to provide, um, interact with a lot of these virtual entities to be able to serve the clients we need to be able to serve. Also, more personalization of healthcare, again, in this patient consumerization. So it's really getting the patient to be a partner with the physician and to be able to have a more personal relationship, less of a formal, sterile type relationship. But this is what we're looking at in the 2020s. Um, the pandemic has certainly changed the way 
some healthcare has been delivered. We've talked, you know, I just mentioned in terms of virtual, um, and it's going to continue to change some some cost. What the pandemic did for us is it really number one brought to light the fact that research and the implementation of of vaccines, um, medication treatments, um, can be rapidly rapidly advanced. And from the research that was done to produce the COVID-19 vaccine that using the, um, the RNA and creating this vaccine and not necessarily taking it from the live virus is actually opening up research in terms of being able to treat cancer and eliminate cancer in some areas, as well as some other disease processes. So, the pandemic, as tragic as it has been, um, as devastating it has, has been, with some resiliency, we're actually learning some things and some things are going to change within healthcare because of the pandemic. So as social workers working in healthcare, we need to actually be at the forefront of some of these changes. We need to be able to say, look, this exposed for our long-term care facilities and our aging population, this actually exposed the isolation that these individuals have. And we know isolation and, um, is as deadly as cancer or is as deadly as other diseases, heart disease. So there's been some, some cracks in our system that has been exposed. Um, the importance of science and needing to follow the science. The importance of data and how to present data in a way so that individuals can understand it and verify that it's accurate. So there's been a lot of cracks that have been identified that will help move our healthcare forward and we can actually improve it and reduce cost. There's still many ways to reduce cost, but we have to tackle some very big social <clears throat> or societal beliefs about healthcare. And we're going to get into some of that in this first module, um, the differences of it, but really be thinking about, because if we're not consciously aware of it, then we're actually in that biased perception, is healthcare a right or is it an earned privilege? And how do we determine that within our system? From a social work perspective, we're there to advocate for individuals. Individuals should have the right to receive health care, but at what level? Is it just preventive services? Is it um, expensive services? Is it all the MRIs that we do? That's the other driver of health care cost is we do so many tests in the United States that are really unnecessary and it doesn't change the outcomes for individuals. When we look at longevity, when we look at um, infant mortality, when we look at some of those things, the tests that we do only really impacts a fairly few people, but those people are important. So these are things that we have to struggle with. And as social workers, we do have to, we do have to bother ourselves with this because if our healthcare institutions are not financially viable, they're not going to exist to provide the services that our clients need. <clears throat> so we have to look at the whole picture. And we are the one profession that truly does look at that whole picture. So that's just a brief, brief, brief history of social work in the healthcare realm and how it has evolved over time. Um, I've provided some resources here. There's some other resources in terms of looking at how social work has played a role in healthcare over time, but that gets us started for this particular course this summer. So I'm excited to be bringing you information and sharing with you my area of expertise. I was a healthcare social worker um, prior to coming into the academic world and continued to be even through um, until 2016, I guess, is when I finally gave up my PRM position. Healthcare is my first love. I've been a hospital social worker. I've been in the ER. I've been on skilled nursing facilities. I've been in long-term care, home health, hospice. Um, I've done the whole continuum. So it is my personal um, infatuation. I love the healthcare aspect of it. I love the, 
dealing with all the different pieces that have to be put together. And now in my research, I'm moving back into the healthcare realm and um, focusing on the artificial intelligence and automation to improve outcomes for individuals, specifically for aging individuals right now. So this is my passion, and I think you're going to see that. So just kind of have to blow that off because I know it's just an elective for y'all this summer, but healthcare and our clients' healthcare, even if we're just, if our focus is mental health, we have to merge the two. We have to be able to say health, wellness, mental health, all of that, because it all comes together and makes us the person that we are. And so we have to be able to even address some healthcare issues if that's not our primary focus when we're working with our clients. So I hope you get a lot out of this, um, this course this summer. And I'm certainly up for, if you need any other information, putting you in touch with some different resources. So have a great first week and move on to the next, um, the next presentation and you'll learn a little bit more about our healthcare system.